share my screen on desktop too. There we go. Um, great. So, uh, which plugins? We haven't really done too much with plugins in Visual Studio Code, uh, but there's a uh, bunch that uh, uh, you can certainly read up on uh, as they become useful to you. Uh, uh, the built in functionality in Visual Studio Code uh, shows JavaScript effectively, uh, it shows HTML effectively. Uh, uh, if we start working on uh, a, a SQL for our database next week, uh, we may actually uh, use a, a, a SQL uh, plugin uh, for uh, Visual Studio Code. Uh, and it does the same thing that uh, when you're in there in JavaScript and it changes the color of different command keywords uh, or does autocomplete, uh, uh, the same thing can happen in, uh, a, 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 in SQL in your database queries. Uh, uh, it, it's got uh, a plugin for pretty much every language under the sun. Uh, and uh, uh, this makes it just a whole lot easier to use when it gives you some hinting and some highlighting uh, and some formatting. Uh, I actually, in my use of Visual Studio Code, use some plugins that I have not had you guys install uh, that uh, are uh, some prettifying pl uh, plugins, so it always makes my uh, uh, brackets align to the right uh, uh, place and indent to the right level, uh, uh, makes code more readable. Uh, I have a uh, collapsing plugin uh, uh, that lets me uh, clap sections of code uh, and hide them when I'm not looking at them. Uh, uh, just uh, things that uh, that make uh, Visual Studio Code become a more powerful tool. And I wouldn't, haven't wanted to complicate your experience of Visual Studio Code uh, to this point by that yet. Uh, but uh, if you do some searching on Visual Studio Code plugins, uh, you'll see a lot of the power that that brings to it. In terms of the terminal, we decided to standardize on uh, Git Bash, just so we only had one set of terminal commands for everybody to uh, use, but there are other terminals in there. Um, modules, uh, so uh, we haven't really talked about modules in here, and we probably won't for the most part, uh, but these are ways of uh, componentizing code uh, and making it move in, uh, in blocks, uh, so you can depend on collections of functionality. Um, HTML generation, uh, when we're actually uh, yeah, yeah, generating our HTML rather than writing it, it explicitly, uh, uh, you uh, have uh, things like minification of your uh, HTML, uh, you can have plugins that affect that process. Uh, when I'm working in React, I very rarely write the HTML pages directly. Uh, my HTML page uh, is usually a uh, blank page with a single div, uh, and then in React, uh, I uh, inject uh, HTML code into that div. Uh, so I'm actually uh, computing across my HTML. Uh, uh, this came out in the uh, discussion of the receipts uh, in uh, the uh, last homework problem, uh, where uh, you know ideally uh, you'd have a receipt of infinite length uh, that uh, if somebody puts 73 toppings on a pizza, well, I give them a receipt with 73 lines on it. Uh, um, in order to do that in raw HTML, uh, it's very, very difficult. You have to actually create a table with 73 lines on it. Uh, and uh, maybe in your CSS, you hide those uh, lines. Uh, but uh, it's a really cumbersome process. Uh, if I were doing this on the server side uh, in uh, React, uh, what I would do is actually in my JavaScript, I'd just have a for loop, uh, or I'd, uh, in fact, probably just have a for each loop. Uh, and I'd say for each receipt line, uh, create this table line. Uh, and then you're injecting that HTML code back into uh, the document object model automatically uh, and not writing it uh, manually in an HTML file anymore. HTML is still the same language, you're just getting it there right, in a different way. Yeah. And so this HTML generation uh, is uh, a whole bunch of decisions about how you'll actually uh, create HTML programmatically and how you'll inject it back into the document object model. The next set of things in here uh, are uh, transpiling. So I've used that term a few times, uh, and uh, this is going from one JavaScript language to another JavaScript language. Uh, the browser is capable of, uh, in most cases, uh, uh, talking only in terms of uh, ECMAScript 2015 or uh, ES5. Uh, and we've got ES6 and ES7 that are uh, well enough defined to use today. Uh, if you're actually going back to really old browsers, uh, transpilers allow you to uh, uh, create a version of JavaScript that uh, IE9 or IE7 or uh, things that uh, uh, may not have been around for the last 10 years uh, uh, can still talk to. Uh, and it may be a degraded version of the functionality. Uh, they may not be able to do all the bells and whistles, but at least you can use the same JavaScript language. What is this one you want? Do that not just start over? Uh, not just start over. What do you mean? Okay, you're going from one language to another. Like, why would one do that? Is so, that, like, that code and putting into different code, why would one do that? Why would you just start over in the next other? So, so let's think about a situation uh, where you uh, have a very broad user base. 
metrics. Uh, I remember when uh, we were doing the search engine optimization class and we looked at that graph of uh, market penetration of different browsers uh, yeah. and saw that uh, a, a combination of IE and uh, yeah, Chrome uh, have about 80% of the browser market. Uh, uh, for the stuff we're writing, that's plenty. And we can just say, okay, Chrome is it. And the latest version of Chrome is the only thing I'm going to run on. Uh, yeah. uh, but uh, let's say you're uh, developing an application uh, for uh, 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 retirees to find uh, a, a, a hobby so, or, or to uh, find a group of uh, a, a, a people to uh, go to the movie with. Uh, and uh, this is a uh, user group that uh, they may have been given a computer in uh, 2001 and never updated it. Uh, a grandchild has to tell them how to use it or told them how to use it once and uh, that's how they've stuck ever since. Uh, they may be using IE3 uh, on that 10 year old or 15 year old computer. Uh, and uh, if you want your application to render to their browser, uh, then you're either going to have to write in a very, very bare bones version of JavaScript, which is uh, gonna have a lot of complications and be harder to write to, uh, or you write in a modern JavaScript and have your transpiler simply at runtime uh, uh, create a version that will run on that older browser. Uh, and then you can use all the new language constructs and uh, use all of the uh, right way of setting up a uh, modern web application uh, and still have it form a, a, a version that can render on those very old browsers. So the modern way of doing it would work on a really modern browser, but it would have sort of like a secondary like you would recognize what browser it is and sort of go into a secondary browser? Well, so kind of. Uh, uh, let's, let's think again about those user strings that I was just saying, uh, that when a browser connects to the uh, server, uh, uh, it's making an HTTP request uh, saying, uh, hey, I'm a, a, a browser, Chrome version 11. Uh, I, 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 please send me a web page uh, I, I, that is your uh, home page. Uh, um, or another one might be uh, saying, uh, hey, I'm IE version 4, uh, yeah, please send me your home page. Uh, and then what's actually going to happen, and I just talked about this in HTML generation, uh, is that uh, your server is going to uh, say, uh, okay, now I'm going to generate a page to deliver to this client. Uh, um, I'm going to pull these pictures out. I'm going to pull uh, 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 this code out. Uh, and uh, I'm going to munge it all together in a way and hand this back as an HTML page to the client. Uh, and that HTML page is going to be different in the case of those two user strings, uh, that your transpiler uh, would actually be converting to the older form of JavaScript for the IE4, uh, uh, but it would be using all the new modern language features to the uh, modern Chrome browser. Yep. Yep. yep, that's right. You can, and, and when you're uh, generating your HTML, and rather than writing uh, HTML explicitly, uh, it's just a couple lines of code to say, hey, what's the browser? Uh, what do I uh, do with this? Uh, and uh, in some cases, it's really annoying. I uh, discovered that uh, on uh, Drive BC, uh, now that I've got this piece of property up the Malahat, uh, uh, what's happening on the Malahat is very important to me. Uh, and if I uh, log on from my desktop machine, uh, then I can actually see how much snow is on the ground. Uh, if I log on from my phone, even if I say request desktop site, uh, it will not show me that information. Uh, it's got some stuff that is just blocked off. Uh, and so you can do uh, the uh, browser uh, targeting uh, in smart ways or in, uh, in annoying ways uh, and uh, try and do it in smart ways. Uh, other things in the transpilation uh, is uh, that uh, uh, production versus development configurations are very important. Uh, when I'm developing my application, uh, I want to be able to open up my uh, Chrome developer console, see all of my debug messages come up. I want to be able to browse through my code. Uh, I want to have all the pieces that allow me to uh, develop it and understand what's going on inside uh, very prominently presented. Uh, when I send this to my users, I may not want them to have any access to my code or my internals. Uh, and so in my uh, production form of transpilation, uh, I might uh, obfuscate all the code that's being uh, presented. Uh, you can either uh, have JavaScript that's very, very easy to read, uh, or you can have JavaScript that's a, uh, a tangled nightmare of 150 character long variable names uh, that, uh, that are just uh, about like each other uh, and uh, all munched in with no spaces or anything. And it's still valid JavaScript, it still works, uh, but uh, uh, good luck reading that and trying to get anything useful out of it. Uh, 
So obfuscation is something that production does differently than get. Kind of. Uh, so there, there are a lot of uh, benefits to the native app as compared to browser apps uh, in terms of efficiency of code uh, usage, in terms of being able to force updates, uh, uh, in terms of having a development cycle that's not tied to a browser update cycle. But um, it, it has a lot of costs too, uh, because then you have to uh, build totally separate applications for iOS and, uh, and Android, for instance. Uh, um, uh, but uh, but yeah, it, it, you do get to depend on newer, more up to date features uh, automatically uh, when you're writing native apps and uh, whatever. So here we are to the middle column, uh, the bundler. I talked a little bit about Webpack and how it, uh, it builds packages of all your files and dependencies and sends them down. Um, we haven't talked at all about linting. So uh, is linting a term that uh, means anything to anybody in here? No? Okay. Um, um, so I'll show you an example in just a, a, a minute, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, bundlers. <laughs> so you're writing the server. Who's writing the server? Uh, th this is what, uh, in that little video, uh, Corey was talking about there being an overwhelming number of choices. Uh, and uh, so uh, I've used uh, a, a Webpack, I've used Gulp, I've used Grunt, I've used Browserify, uh, a, a couple more archaic run uh, bundlers prior to that. Uh, and uh, I, yeah, the question of how do you pick a bundler uh, is uh, basically uh, uh, what do you know, what do the people on your team know, and what functionality do you want out of it? Uh, and I would never uh, build a new project for you guys to start on that was based on Browserify anymore. Uh, um, it's just too cumbersome. Uh, and so I'm going to help you make some of these decisions. Uh, but uh, if you're building a web server uh, and you're building a development environment for doing web development, then absolutely you get to pick what pieces go onto your web server. Uh, and one of those pieces is a bundler. Um, so, uh, so this is where uh, Corey's course on how do you uh, develop a JavaScript uh, development and build environment uh, is uh, what goes into making all of this myriad set of decisions. Uh, when you're working on different projects with clients, do they sometimes already out? Absolutely, yeah. And, and uh, it's really the rarity that I get to start from scratch and find my whole tool set. Uh, uh, when I'm going into an established company, they've got a build process in place, and they've got some of these shows, and some of them uh, need to be shows, and, and uh, I can parameterize them differently. Yeah, but uh, this is why it's really kind of important that I've touched all of these uh, different four or five or six bundlers at some point in time, because otherwise I have no idea how the build process is working. I wouldn't advise the older ones. They get cumbersome, and I really hate them. So, so starting a new project, use Webpack or uh, possibly Gulp. But, uh, the rest of them I wouldn't touch. Uh, so what linting is, uh, uh, when you're writing code, uh, the way that we've been doing it, uh, you don't find out until very, very late in the process when you've made an error. Um, it's really when you uh, try running the code, maybe even after you've uploaded it to the server uh, and you open it in a browser, that you open the developer console and go, uh, oh shoot, there's an error in there. Uh, uh, in an ideal world, uh, you'd know about that uh, really just as soon as you type the error. Uh, or at least as soon as you save the file that, that has the, the, the error in it. Uh, and I'm not necessarily even talking about syntax errors. It's not that something is broken. Uh, uh, maybe it's something is not spaced correctly. Uh, maybe I've got uh, my indentation uh, messed up a little bit so it's hard to read. Uh, or I've used a variable name uh, that uh, is a, uh, a, a hard to understand variable name. Uh, I, if I uh, have on my uh, project uh, this, uh, uh, consistency standard that all of my variable names are supposed to be camel case, uh, um, or that uh, all of my uh, global variables should be in capital letters. Uh, you can write linter rules that uh, will uh, enforce this. Uh, and uh, then as soon as I uh, save that file, uh, the linter runs automatically. And in my console window, uh, it'll pop up these warning messages saying uh, improper uh, variable, uh, or uh, uh, you've never used this variable. Uh, 
And uh, so then I really never need to leave my editor. Uh, I, I just hit save a few times and watch the messages screen past. Uh, and uh, it, it's very efficient to really kind of be in place correcting the style errors and the uh, syntax errors that creep up. And so uh, linting depends on uh, what your uh, rules are in your organization, what you want to have as your consistency guidelines, uh, what language it is that you're in, uh, what uh, you want to call an error versus a warning. Uh, uh, there are plugins into the linter uh, to uh, you know, do uh, kind of deeper analysis. Uh, if I want to make sure that uh, I use efficient data structures, I can have a linter that uh, I actually knew about data structures and enforced that I didn't uh, use uh, I, I, an array that was longer than it needed to be, for instance, or something like that. Uh, so there's all this functionality that can plug into these real-time test, uh, yeah, yeah, testing and checking systems. Uh, and uh, it, it, altogether, that's called a, uh, a linter. And ESLint is the uh, linter that I uh, am uh, really most uh, yeah, favoring these days. Uh, but uh, there's a variety of different linters. Uh, it's ESLint that we'll actually uh, talk about how to set up when we uh, go into setting up the gold environment next class. Though. Questions on linting? Did that make everything clear as mud? Yeah. Cool. Well, so the linter is part of the bundler. Uh, that uh, uh, what uh, the bundler does uh, in part is uh, watches the file system for all the files in your project, uh, and uh, when it sees anything change, uh, it runs the linter. And then if the linter passes, uh, it runs the bundler to uh, bundle them all up into a new uh, deliverable to push down to the client. So it's all kind of part of the same the same interrelated system in there. So testing is the next set of things in here. Uh, we're going to not follow a terribly rigorous testing process in this uh, in this class, uh, uh, yeah, just because of time. We can't touch everything. Uh, but uh, uh, on a bigger project, uh, yeah, this is a huge area. Um, uh, yeah, testing uh, on a yeah, big project uh, it can't be done manual anymore. Uh, that uh, there are just too many variations of code, uh, too many ways you can use the user interface, uh, and maybe a bug only pops up uh, when you. Uh, uh, first log in as a, uh, a as a new user and then create this file and then uh, select this option uh, and uh, anytime you have uh, more than a few choices in the user interface uh, the uh, permutations of those choices become almost impossible to manually test anymore uh, and so the way that this is generally uh, done on major projects is to have a set of automated tests that uh, will uh, basically uh, play like a user by injecting clicks by injecting typing into fields uh, and uh, they can go through a large number of permutations of this uh, automatically. Yeah. And uh, in fact, the testers on big projects are generally developers. They're software development engineers and tests, SDETs. Uh, and uh, uh, they're writing uh, automated code to check the code the developers uh, of the uh, product uh, are checking in. Uh, and these automated tests uh, have to uh, be uh, run every time a build goes. Uh, so I talked about that continuous integration process uh, where when I check in the master build, uh, it automatically deploys to the server and then the automated tests run on it automatically uh, and then it deploys to uh, uh, yeah, the, yeah, the actual client. Uh, these automated tests come out of a uh, library uh, and uh, the library, for instance, knows how to do things like simulate keyboard input and mouse input. Uh, uh, the library might have access to my uh, backend data structures and be able to inject new things into my variables. Uh, and uh, so this testing framework uh, is uh, part of the decisions you make with your uh, build process and development environment. Uh, uh, Mocha, for instance, is uh, the uh, testing uh, framework I tend to, uh, to be most in favor of these days uh, for JavaScript. Uh, but there's a wide variety of them uh, and uh, just another set of decisions you have to, uh, to make. Uh, project structure, I kind of am feeling like eyes are glazing and this is probably not as, uh, a, a, as critical to the decisions we're making in here. Uh, uh, HTTP, yeah, we've got libraries, we've got schemas, we've got data generation. Uh, a production build, I kind of talked over about with transpiling here. Uh, uh, minification, bundle splitting, uh, splitting, cache bursting, error logging. Uh, uh, just it goes on and on and on of uh, things you can think about. Uh, but I think we've kind of hit the uh, the set of things that we should think about for today. Well, it kind of depends on how you're uh, how you're doing things. Uh, 
Uh, big in the software development world these days are uh, test-driven development teams. And so uh, the uh, developer themselves are actually writing the test to test their code. Uh, and then they write their code uh, to make sure the tests all pass. Uh, um, and so that's kind of the modern agile way of doing uh, test development. Uh, uh, so you never write a line of code that goes to your client uh, before you write the lines of code that would test that line, line of code that you write. Uh, and in that model, uh, the, uh, when you check in, your tests also get checked in. Uh, and then if anything you do later in the development process break those tests, uh, uh, your automated tests come up with and flag, uh, hey, this needs to be fixed, or at least look at this and revise the, uh, the test. Uh, in a uh, slightly older system of, uh, of uh, development, uh, what was going on most of the time I was at Microsoft uh, is that uh, there was a separate bug database, uh, and uh, when a bug was filed, it always had to have a test associated with it. Uh, so when the bug was fixed, that test would pass, uh, and then you'd know uh, that uh, you could move on and close the bug. Uh, and uh, so the way that that happened there uh, was that uh, the bugs would be filed by the testers. Uh, there'd be triage meetings to triage the severity of the bugs. Uh, uh, you decide which ones you're going to fix, which ones you're going to defer, uh, and uh, uh, then the uh, tests that were associated with the ones that you decided you were going to fix uh, uh, get logged and go on to the continuous integration platform so they get verified before they're actually closed. But uh, so there's a number of different ways of doing it, and it kind of depends on what your team discipline is. Uh, uh, of course, in here on this size project, it's all ad hoc, and uh, uh, even on most of the uh, projects that I uh, run for clients, uh, where it's only me and a couple other developers working on it, uh, testing is much more ad hoc. Uh, it's really only when you get to a uh, project that is uh, uh, significant enough in size that you can't get full coverage by manually testing that you go to some of these strategies. Okay, so many decisions. Mm -hmm. So I thought we could go through a, a, a sample project and just see how some of these pieces uh, stick together. Uh, and uh, what I was going to do with uh, with this, uh, and uh, it feels like I've been talking a long time. Uh, uh, people, uh, it's about eight o'clock. Uh, people okay to keep pushing through things, or one another couple minute break? Okay, let's push through things then. Um, so what I uh, did with this, uh, and I fished around a uh, fair amount for uh, an example to uh, uh, to show, uh, and uh, ended up grabbing a uh, kind of random. Uh, a virtual reality based example. I don't want you to worry at all about the content of the project. Uh, it's just something that I was interested in uh, seeing how A-Frame worked and so I grabbed A-Frame and uh, realized okay this actually illustrates most of the things I wanted to talk about in terms of build, uh, build environment. Uh, but I want to uh, show you uh, what uh, uh, I do to build it locally uh, and what I do to build it remotely on the, uh, the server. Uh, and um, so let's look at the uh, project here first. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm still recording, so it's all going to be horribly, painfully slow. So uh, this is by a developer I don't know, John Biz. He wrote a, a simple static React A-frame. And A-frame is a, a virtual reality development library. Uh, uh, static means that uh, it uh, really doesn't have a lot of server-side code. Uh, uh, yeah, React, of course, is the, uh, the the user interface framework that it's sitting within, uh, and uh, Simple is just a uh, basic one to uh, to start with. Uh, and uh, so, uh, yeah, looking at the uh, README here, uh, it's uh, saying it's a minimal boilerplate for VR sites in React and A-Frame. Uh, uh, this repo gives you ES6 uh, React, uh, uh, A-Frame and React A-Frame, CSS modules, uh, and uh, development builds. Uh, a uh, watch file uh, basically just means that uh, you, you, once you have the uh, uh, the server running, it's going to watch for changes that you're making, uh, so it will update automatically uh, and do the build automatically. And I'll show you what I mean by that in uh, in just a minute. Um, we won't look at his uh, server to see the output uh, because uh, we're going to look at the uh, one on my uh, machine here in just a uh, moment. Uh, and we don't really care about the uh, actual tags that are uh, developing the uh, VR scene in there because I'm not asking you to write any A-frame uh, uh, code in here. So to set up, uh, we're going to uh, just do a git clone. And uh, let me uh, go ahead and uh, open uh, my uh, git bash shell. Oh, someday. Here we go. I always feel like I need a faster machine when I'm actually recording and I'm trying to show. Uh, this is uh, 
probably don't actually need a faster machine, but I just get impatient. Maybe I just want a new computer. <laughs> No, they really aren't. Uh, so I created a uh, directory node uh, where I was putting all the node examples. Uh, and uh, then in here, I've actually already uh, git cloned uh, the uh, simple static A-frame. Uh, and uh, so I'll just uh, CD into that. Um, I uh, then uh, did this NPM install. And uh, if I uh, do it again, uh, it will probably uh, remind me of what I have installed. Uh, as compared to actually installing it. Uh, it took 10 or, uh, 10 or 12 minutes to actually do the initial install on this, uh, um, just because it was pulling in a, a whole bunch of packages. Uh, and so I'll, I'll, in just a moment here, show you the uh, directory structure of those packages that it uh, pulled in. Uh, um, it's gonna uh, have to go out and confirm that there weren't any changes, is what it's taking a little bit of time for now. Uh, is uh, uh, NPM, of course, being a package manager, uh, it's, uh, I got a repository up there, so uh, when I define the packages that are being used, I usually say, uh, uh, give me a version four of uh, Lodash, uh, yeah, but I use an upwards caret, uh, so uh, version upwards caret four, uh, meaning anything above version four. Uh, and so uh, because NPM's a uh, live package registry, if uh, between the time when I did this at home this afternoon and the time I'm doing it now, uh, a version 4.01 had been released, uh, it would actually pull down the updated version uh, and uh, try and run that now. Uh, if I wanted to instead, I could say get exactly equal to uh, version 4.0.0, uh, and then it would not go up and uh, do that piece. Uh, and here's where I'd make some of those decisions about whether I wanted uh, a very reproducible exact build process uh, or whether I wanted to take advantage of the, yeah, the new features that might be available uh, in uh, new versions of Lodash that, uh, that came up out there. Yeah, so uh, let's actually uh, a, a look at that file because it's a, an important point of writing a, uh, an NPM uh, program. Uh, and I'm gonna uh, open up a new Git bash so I can uh, do this without uh, waiting for uh, the NPM install, which seems to be interminable on a slow connection here on a slow computer. So this is another one of these. I'm going to uh, hop into untangling, node, and simple. And then uh, let's uh, open my editor. Hmm. Someday my editor will open. There we go. Oh, how to open Visual Studio Code from a command line? Yeah. Right, yeah, code dot opens everything in the uh, in the directory and subdirectories underneath it. It does not, however, populate for an interminable amount of time when other things are going on on the machine. Jeez. Oh, that's still going on too, of course. Yeah, yeah, no, this is entirely because my disk is getting hit because I'm recording to uh, here and my network's getting hit because I'm sharing from here and I have only one machine with one processor. Um, so that's the yeah, the cost of uh, recording things is that everything uh, everything gets slower. Sure, good, good. Okay, so uh, we're looking at uh, the uh, contents of this A-frame project and you'd ask the question of how does NPM uh, install know uh, what versions of uh, things to uh, to pick up. And so this package.json file uh, is uh, what is actually uh, uh, keeping track of that. Uh, and so in package.json, uh, I've uh, got uh, the name of the package. This is simple static React A-frame, uh, some descriptions, some keywords, uh, 
I, I've uh, got the stuff that fires off the uh, web pack. Uh, and so uh, if I uh, say uh, npm build, uh, what it's actually turning into is npm run web pack. Uh, and then web pack is what's actually doing the bundling here. Uh, but uh, this list of uh, individual dependencies uh, is what's uh, actually driving the npm install process. And so uh, I've got a dependency of A-Frame, of A-Frame React, of uh, Babel uh, Core, Babel Loader, Babel Polyfill, Babel Preset ES 2015. Uh, these are all the transpiler pieces that allow me to uh, decode back down to uh, older versions. Uh, um, and uh, then uh, CSS loader. So this is loading CSS files uh, and uh, uh, combining them into a single CSS file that would go down to the uh, client. Uh, I, I'm not sure what extract text uh, webpack is. Uh, uh, these are the React ones. Uh, style loader is related to CSS files. Uh, and then webpack and webpack dev server. Now what those all turn into uh, are uh, stuff down in the node modules directory. Uh, Node modules is what NPM install is actually managing. Uh, and uh, so if I open up node modules, uh, which I would really never do in uh, normally running this project, uh, um, unless I wanted to see what somebody else's code was doing in there if I was tracking down a particularly bad bug. Uh, all the uh, things in node modules are automatically managed and then bundled uh, so that they form the JS that's pushed down to the client. Uh, but you'll see inside node modules, uh, I've got a, a vast number more modules than I do have uh, uh, top level dependencies. Uh, and uh, this is because each one of these dependencies itself is using NPM and it's pulling in uh, its dependencies. Uh, so this is an entire dependency tree uh, and I'm uh, only down to the, uh, the Ds after uh, yeah, scrolling through page and page here. Uh, and so the, uh, the downside of uh, using NPM with all this dependency tree uh, is that uh, the amount of code I've actually got in my application uh, is almost unfathomably large at this point. Uh, it's not uncommon for me to have a uh, build directory that has 200 megs of uh, code in it. Uh, and uh, I don't have to uh, myself manage all 200 megs of code. Uh, yeah. So. Um, uh, when, uh, when we've been doing uh, web pages, uh, we've just been having a, a directory that uh, had uh, a JS file, uh, an HTML file, and maybe a couple CSS files. Uh, uh, when I uh, do so uh, in a build environment like this, uh, uh, I've got a public file, which is where all my generated files go. Uh, I've got a source directory that has all of my source files, and it's usually a directory tree of source files. Uh, and then I have my node modules directory, which is all the dependencies that are automatically in here. Uh, and so it becomes a bigger thing to manage. Uh, and uh, to the client, they don't see all that because we're just pushing down what's in the public directory. Yeah, but the infrastructure that we have on the server to uh, uh, build our server project uh, it, it is much, much bigger than it is when we're manually doing all the coding ourselves. Now, of course, this has benefits, and the benefits that this has uh, is that uh, you can draw on a lot of functionality uh, without having to write it yourself. Uh, and uh, so uh, yeah, yeah, the fact that you have all this code in here to, uh, to draw on means you can do really amazing things without writing more than a line or two of code uh, directly. Uh, but you carry around a whole lot of dependencies to, uh, to make this happen. Uh, and uh, the reason that npm install took 10 or 12 minutes the first time is that that uh, a directory tree of several hundred node modules, uh, subdirectories, uh, is probably 200 megs of data that uh, it was uh, it was in here to, uh, to to do all this to build my code. And so things just get slower. Yep. This is now on my computer. That's right. That's right. That's right. And so then it's static in between that. It's not doing anything else. Uh, um, although often part of my build process uh, is to have npm install as part of the build process, so it pulled, pulls down the latest, uh, sees that all of my automated tests run on the latest stuff, and then it deploys the latest stuff out. Uh, and then if you get in a process of not updating, of not doing npm install, uh, and two or three version changes happen under things, uh, it can be harder to adapt and change your code to make up for all those new versions. Uh, so there's a real incentive to have your automated processes uh, keep you up to date on the different versions of dependencies. That's right, exactly. Yeah, if you don't have the automated tests in there, you might make a decision not to update. Uh, or instead of uh, putting, uh, like I have here, that uh, little upwards carrot uh, on A-frame, uh, I uh, might just uh, have, uh, um, do any of these have an exact? They don't. Uh, if I didn't have the upwards carrot, uh, it would be specifying an exact version in there. 
And so if I didn't want to do updates, I might just not uh, say uh, update in my uh, package.json and then I'd stay on that version forever. Um, so let's see if, uh, yeah, npm stall finished. Uh, so uh, skipping an optional dependency FS events uh, uh, because that doesn't exist on uh, Windows uh, platforms. Uh, and uh, warning that uh, a uh, version of the A-Frame React uh, needed something else, but uh, it's just a warning, so I can uh, basically ignore that. So if we look back at the um, usage side of this in uh, GitHub, uh, say uh, for uh, development, uh, run uh, npm run dev, uh, and the Webpack server will run on port 4000, uh, serve the contents of the public directory. So let's do that right now. Let's say npm run dev. Yeah, let's chunk away and think about that for a minute. A long minute, perhaps. Um, so what this is actually doing, uh, yeah, while it's chunking away thinking about that, uh, is uh, in our scripts, uh, we uh, have a... Uh, uh, an npm run and then dev, and so that's saying run webpack dev server uh, with uh, a, a port of 4000, uh, a progress indicator, uh, a, 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 and uh, a, on a content base and in the public directory. And uh, so if we uh, look at uh, webpack dev server over here, uh, uh, this is uh, defined in our webpack config. Uh, and uh, so uh, that has uh, entries for what uh, JS and style sheets we're picking up, uh, uh, what our output is, uh, you know, what our module loaders are uh, doing, and what pl uh, plugins we have in there. And uh, so uh, basically, Webpack and NPM work together to allow us to uh, just use script commands uh, in package.json to start our build environment. And I think we probably got finished building by that point. Uh, it's going to say uh, that uh, React A-Frame is running. It's on port 4000. And uh, so if I go in my browser to uh, localhost 4000, oops, localhost 4000. Then someday. We will end up connecting. And it can't find it because apparently it's not actually done running. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this is really painful recording this at the same time. This part is actually when I'm not recording uh, just a, 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 a minute or so uh, and it's, uh, it, it's all done. Hmm. Here we go, finally. Hmm. So what it's doing in here in the first part uh, is uh, building some modules uh, and uh, then uh, the result is being served up uh, from localhost 4000 webpack dev server and someday we'll actually get done building these modules. While it's doing that, I think I'm going to actually uh, confuse y'all uh, and uh, jump over uh, and uh, show how we would do this on the, uh, uh, the server. So I don't use SSH directly. Uh, I've got uh, this program called Kitty that I've described a couple of times that do uh, my uh, SSH interactions. Uh, and uh, what uh, Kitty does is pops up all the different machines I can SSH into uh, and uh, uh, then uh, saves my passwords and stuff for me. So I'm going to uh, pop up into uh, dev00, which is the uh, test account I've been using for this class. I'm going to CD into public HTML. I'm going to uh, look at this stuff. And I think I uh, have a node directory in here, don't I? And uh, then I've got my uh, simple uh, static React A-frame in there. And uh, so what I'm going to do uh, in here, actually, uh, is follow the other side of uh, the uh, uh, instructions for this, uh, which uh, are saying uh, that in production, which my web server is always production, uh, 
my uh, local machine is where I do development, uh, but uh, when I push to the web server, uh, because uh, it's the Apache web server running it, uh, I can't have the Express web server uh, running uh, up on my uh, web server in addition to Apache. Uh, it has to run on Apache. Uh, and so I'm using a production build process as compared to my development build process. Uh, and it's saying that I should do uh, the command npm run build. Uh, and uh, so uh, I'll uh, run that uh, in my uh, directory up here. npm run build. And that will go through uh, basically the same process that it's doing on my uh, local machine. Uh, but instead of starting the uh, development server uh, and doing the build in the development server, uh, it's just generating the files that need to be uh, run on the web server from, uh, from in there. And uh, it's done that one very quickly because nothing else is happening on the web server machine. It's a more powerful machine. And you can see that it's uh, output uh, the JavaScript, the CSS, a, a couple of map files that allow you to uh, deb do debugging on that. Uh, and uh, it's got a warning about dependencies, but uh, I don't really care about it. It's just a warning. Uh, it's saying that I uh, should really have built A-frame from sources rather than depending on a pre-built uh, A-frame version here. Uh, uh, but I don't actually terribly uh, care about that. And so if I wanted to see what this is uh, doing up on the, uh, the web server now, uh, I would uh, go uh, and go to CSPubble. Um, I did this earlier, but uh, let's go to the node subdirectory, and then I'll just navigate from there down to where I uh, want to be. I may in the future have to find another way of recording my screen. This is too painful. So I've gone inside my simple static React A-frame. I've got the public directory, which is where my generated files went uh, for the uh, production version of this. Uh, when I navigate into uh, my uh, public directory, I can see uh, the actual generated page. I'll uh, come up here in a minute because it, it, it index.html was in here. So here's the project that uh, was, uh, it was created. Uh, and uh, it's just a little VR world with a carpet, uh, and I can use my mouse to, uh, to zoom around on things uh, and look in different directions. And if I wanted to, if I had a Google Cardboard, uh, if I was on a phone or something, uh, I could actually look at this in, uh, in a virtual world as compared to uh, just simulating it on my uh, computer. And it's still kind of slow because my uh, computer, of course, is all bogged down, and this is rendering on my uh, local machine, even though it's being served from the server. If we come back to my local machine, is it finally done? Yeah, it is. So this has gotten uh, done uh, locally here as well. And uh, it's uh, output uh, largely the same things. These are all the build steps that it went through uh, when I was doing the uh, development server. A whole bunch of files got touched, uh, uh, React DOM and uh, FPJS. These are all the dependencies that it was building into the other uh, project from here. And uh, that means that I should be able to, uh, from my uh, local host, reload this now. And I should see the same thing come up. So I'm at this point going to uh, close the server version of this. Uh, and uh, that will hopefully get uh, a little bit of the performance bottleneck off of uh, here. Uh, and uh, I, I want to show you uh, what some of the benefits of this build environment uh, are. Uh, so I've compiled with warnings. Uh, let's say that I wanted to uh, edit uh, some of the stuff that's, uh, that's in here. Uh, and uh, I said we wouldn't really worry about uh, the uh, components of the A-frame library or how we were doing that. Uh, but uh, uh, let's say that I want to change some of the, uh, the lighting uh, that's in here. Uh, and just so you can see what this uh, looks like, I've got this uh, nice, strong, bright light. Looks like it might be the sun uh, shining from behind us or something. Uh, uh, yeah, sitting over here on the uh, surface of the ocean, uh, if uh, we're, uh, might be what that's supposed to be. Let's change what that light is anyways. Uh, and uh, instead of it being that uh, really bright one, uh, let's make it a uh, really dim light. So I'm just going to change the intensity of the uh, uh, direction one light. Uh, and uh, we'll bring that from point 0.8 down to point 0.2. And then I'm going to save this. And when I save that, uh, we'll see that here uh, it says Webpack Compiling. Uh, 10% uh, uh, zero of one build modules. Uh, 
And if there are any warnings, uh, I didn't have to do anything to make it uh, do that. Uh, it was just watching the directories that were in my project uh, and knew to automatically uh, pick up and compile anything that changed in there uh, so it would display it. Uh, and if I'd had a warning in here, uh, it would have uh, popped out and given me a uh, warning. Uh, in this case, though, uh, I, uh, nothing at least so far has popped out. And I just changed a, uh, a parameter to uh, one of the functions. So it probably shouldn't give me a warning, um, at least not other than the one that I'd already uh, that I'd known about from last time. So popping back over to the uh, screen then, uh, if I were to uh, refresh this, uh, uh, yeah, that will uh, give me my uh, newly compiled version rather than the one that uh, was on here previously. Uh, and uh, we uh, should see uh, someday my new light. And that's a very dim light now rather than a very bright light. So you can see the process of actually uh, editing and making changes uh, is fairly streamlined as compared to uh, having to uh, uh, manually build and push up to a server. Uh, and I have the benefits of these uh, linting and uh, warning changes in here. Uh, so if I were uh, to instead uh, in uh, this, uh, I don't know, uh, let's uh, say I uh, misnamed uh, intensity. Uh, um, I suspect that I'm going to, uh, at this point, because there is no property, uh, intensit uh, of uh, a uh, light, um, uh, it'll uh, start building uh, that again uh, and uh, hopefully give me a uh, warning right at the bat that uh, that wasn't uh, an appropriate thing to have in there. Although I haven't tried this and so the winter may actually fail on this and I won't know it. And, uh, now the winter didn't obviously have detailed enough rules for uh, what uh, lights uh, have available. Um, that's something that I would have done differently. Uh, that uh, if uh, I had been, and I don't think this is actually using ES lint. Uh, I don't know actually that I saw a linting step in there at all. Um, but uh, in a properly constructed uh, constructed build environment, uh, uh, you would actually have a uh, linter in there that uh, is loaded in Webpack uh, that uh, is uh, enforcing the rules and checking. Um, but no, it is not in this case. So there's no linter in this package. That's too bad. I can't show you the, uh, the linting piece. Um, that's one of the things I really like about the build process, though, is just the immediacy of errors that you get from making mistakes and, uh, and mistyping on things. That actually makes me kind of curious as to, with that misspelling, if I uh, get any light at all when I refresh that. I bet I don't. Oh. I guess if you misspell it, you get 100% intensity on your light. There we go. Who knew? Cool. Um, so all I really wanted to show with that was just an example of a project, and it's not my project. It's just one I pulled down today uh, to uh, show how the uh, build process steps work uh, in this. Uh, I, are there questions that folks have left over about this whole process? Okay. Well. Again, uh, don't try and keep track of the details. We'll go over this again before I actually uh, ask you to do it. Uh, but uh, it's got a, a lot of advantages to uh, do a, uh, a, a build process that, uh, that does all this for you. Um, in the next month, um, more than nothing. Um, by the next class, nothing. Uh, um, but uh, next class, uh, I'm going to have a sample project put together, and uh, you guys will uh, have to deploy that sample project to your server, uh, and uh, uh, we'll talk about how to kick off a build and uh, I, uh, talk about how to install new packages. Uh, um, so uh, bits and pieces of NPM uh, and the build process will be a requirement for Project 3 uh, um, or the homeworks leading up to Project 3. Um, but uh, uh, you will not be responsible in this class for making the uh, fundamental decisions of what bundler to use, what linter to use, uh, uh, the uh, things that go into the build environment. I'll make most of those decisions for you, and you'll just kind of have to know how to use them. Yeah. So I want to talk very briefly about uh, Project 3. Uh, uh, we're going to actually formally assign Project 3 uh, next week, and so uh, talk in more detail about how uh, we're setting up the server and uh, what you're expected to do with databases and that kind of thing. Uh, but uh, uh, the goal of Project 3 is to hook up some of the back-end pieces. We've done uh, front-end pieces to date uh, and uh, want to get it into a back-end build process. And uh, probably talking to a database is the uh, one that uh, is the common denominator across most of your projects. And uh, so uh, 
if uh, y'all uh, use a database successfully, that's a good backend project, and uh, we're uh, yeah, yeah, happy to stop it there. Uh, but uh, uh, there are other services you can use instead. Uh, you can use a calendaring service, or you can use uh, a, uh, a, a an authentication service. There are other things you can choose to do for a backend service instead. Uh, and again, anything that talks JSON is a good example of uh, front end and back end talking. Uh, so kind of think about what pieces you want to make actually work. Uh, I haven't looked at all your projects to, uh, twos yet, of course. Uh, so uh, I might, uh, as I'm looking at those this week, and I will get to those this week. Uh, sorry, I've been so late on grading homework. The projects I'll get to much more promptly. Uh, um, uh, it uh, is uh, something I'll probably make some suggestions on. And uh, here you can uh, flesh out these fairly easy with the back end piece. Uh, and we'll have a bit of a discussion back and forth about what pieces you're working on for a back end. Uh, but I suspect most of you end up on a database or with authentication pieces uh, as uh, being the most uh, straightforward backend uh, uh, piece to, uh, to implement to satisfy this requirement. Um, again, uh, we'll talk in more detail next week about how to layer those backend uh, pieces on, unless people are burning immediate uh, Project 3 questions. Okay. Uh, so the homework this week uh, is uh, actually a uh, written homework rather than a coding homework. Uh, I uh, do want to have you guys do it in GitHub still, uh, just because I want you always uh, using uh, the command line and doing more things in GitHub, and uh, GitHub is, uh, is something you should always be uh, touching on. Uh, but uh, I, I'm going to have you uh, create a, a new project record repository for programming resources and start to make a list of the resources that you're finding useful. Uh, and I uh, want to have you have at least have a couple of subdirectory categories of uh, resources in there. Uh, uh, just to uh, make sure you're uh, familiar with how to do uh, GitHub projects with multiple subdirectories. Uh, uh, can just be text files in there, uh, no real code in there. Uh, and uh, I want you to answer the questions on the following page uh, uh, with enough detail to convince me that you actually understand uh, what I was asking and that you've gone and looked for some resources to answer the questions. Uh, uh, due next week by uh, uh, class time. Uh, and uh, so I want you to answer the question what a backend server is uh, and what are some resources for understanding servers. Uh, ideally, uh, you'll uh, have an idea of what you want to do on your server uh, for your project three, uh, and you'll be doing research that can apply to project three. Uh, so uh, uh, try and make things serve double duty. Uh, but if you don't have a good idea of that, just do some server research. Uh, um, you will probably use a database, either SQL or NoSQL, uh, and uh, we'll talk more about databases next week. Uh, but uh, I, I want you to uh, think about uh, what the differences are and when you'd use one rather than the other. Uh, and find a good uh, couple uh, blog entries or courses uh, or instructional uh, pages uh, on just how you would make decisions between using a SQL or a NoSQL uh, database uh, and uh, how you'd get started about them. Uh, and tell me in your project three which it is you would like to, uh, to use and why. Um, so where to go for help on JavaScript questions? I want you to uh, take ES6, and I've talked about that a little bit tonight, uh, but uh, find me a couple of resources, uh, at least three resources, uh, uh, that help you define what ES6 is and uh, how promises work in ES6. Uh, and I haven't defined promises at all, uh, but uh, I uh, am sure you'll find some information on them and uh, you have some idea of what they are. Uh, there's something that helps with asynchronicity. And then finally, uh, I want you to look into Git Merge uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, talk about uh, this uh, problem of multiple contributors editing the same file. Uh, and uh, I, yeah, I want you to look up uh, what editor is launched from Git Merge automatically and how to use that. Uh, and uh, again, it's not so much because I want you to become an expert with the editor uh, that uh, Git launches, uh, but uh, I want you to know how to change it to your own editor if you want to. Uh, and uh, I want to uh, make sure that you can find the information to answer this kind of question. And the whole point of this week's homework, uh, much more than the uh, last in solving specific homework examples, uh, are uh, to find sources of information and start to get confident with the idea that you can find your own answers to things. Uh, and uh, so uh, if you're just not finding answers or you just don't understand a question, uh, uh, you can ask me, but I'm probably not going to hand out the answers. I'm probably going to uh, give you pointers on where to look for the answers. Questions about this week's homework? Yep, just put text files in your uh, yeah, repo and that's just fine. The only reason I'm putting it in the repo is just more practice and doing repositories and saying that. That's fine. Yeah, any any text editor, just text files. Yep. Yep. You can, but it's a bad way to do it. Um, it, it, it will work for you, uh, but I will laugh at you. What's up?
Uh, you know, if if you're still totally stuck on Git, uh, then uh, please ask me that because uh, I would like to uh, to get you more comfortable with the Git command line. Uh, that's that's really yeah yeah exactly. <laughs> Yep. Okay, well, great. I think we're just going to finish a little bit early tonight. And if uh, people have questions for me, I'm happy to hang around and help with uh, questions or uh, run away. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I killed that. Um, I was uh, going to have folks do a presentation of uh, Project 2. Uh, and uh, uh, it uh, seemed like because we're doing a Project 3 presentation that encompasses it, that, uh, well, the chance to show them off anyways. And uh, because Project 1 took so long, I wasn't going to have time. <laughs>